Part of my job entails tracking and cataloging the various types of demon persona that roam this earth. My name is Fremont Earhart, and I come from a long line of demon catalogers. And before you ask, no, there's absolutely no relation to the human aeronaut, Amelia Earnhardt. I am absolutely overworked, underpaid, and have received absolutely zero benefits, health, dental, or otherwise upon starting this job. My cousins, the esteemed Montclair family, would also like to argue that my job is decidedly less sexy and way less cool than their position as the crown's premier demon hunters. I of course would like to argue otherwise. Sometimes I have cool days, alright. The other day, for example, I had been tracking this thing across the Pacific Northwest, watching as it went from town to town wrecking havoc. Think, the climax fight scene in the Transformer movies, fire and debris everywhere, skyscrapers destroyed, bodies in the street. I had tracked it to a small town outside of Patterson, New Jersey, and was listening to the shriek of the police scanners as the engorged demon tore apart the streets in search of more human meat. I brought my trusty MacBook Pro and was busy sitting in a nearby coffee shop hard at work. I had been having kind of a tough day. I had celebrated a friend's birthday the night before and she had ordered entrees for the table. Unfortunately, she didn't inform me that the pizza wasn't dairy free. So, the entire morning had been spent with Tom's, lots of Advil, and with an upset tummy. Now, demons obviously aren't from this plane of existence. Philosophers, historians, and scientists all have different theories about where these particular beings of energy originate from. Theologists, too. But since they're so completely off base, I've decided to not include them in this roundup. Alternate Dimensions Karmic Energy Recycled Fallen beasts from overlapping universes. I've heard all the ideas. The truth is, no one really knows. What we have done, however, is identify them. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. This day, I think it was a Tuesday, was a very cool one. I had tracked that demon to a defunct paper mill outside the main strip. A group of humans had taken refuge there hoping that the thick steel walls would provide some kind of protection. They were a simpering bunch, whining and wailing and calling out ritualistic words that I've heard used in prayers to their sky god. Absolutely no one thought to draw a perimeter or attempt to barricade the steel doors. Useless anyways. The demon saw this as an opportunity for a tasty snack, and displayed the aggressive predator skills that I've observed before. The hooked dew claws tipped with poison, the hardened armor plates around the vulnerable underbelly, and the displayed blood red fan around its eyeless face, not unlike the fan throated dragon lizard here on Earth. But as it went in for the kill, I noticed that it hesitated. I was absolutely dumbfounded. It's a hogmond. This freaking killing machine doesn't hesitate. What was going on? Claws out, teeth out. This thing was prepared to shred these humans into spaghettios. However, now it was frozen in place, crouched over the weeping and gibbering humans who had backed themselves into a corner of the mill. The humans had backed themselves into the tight space underneath these giant metal stairs that accessed all three levels of the old, decaying paper mill. The stairs themselves were falling apart. Clearly a safety hazard and major workplace violation. Large swaths of the stairs were coated red with rust, with corroded metal piling up an inch thick. Hmm, rust, iron, maybe that had something to do with it. I was crouched nearby to the scene of the crime, furiously taking notes. I had been distracted that morning thanks to my upset stomach and had accidentally left my hotspot at home so I unfortunately wasn't able to use my MacBook Pro all the way out here. Fortunately, I had found my old black book, a blood ink pen, and voice recorder in the backseat of my black Prius, so I was using those instead. I could see the hogmoth straining, the poison dripping from its claws as it labored furiously to reach the whining bags of meat. It clearly wanted to reach the humans, 
but there was something stopping it from reaching its end goal of creating lots of little piles of human meat. But what was it? Ah, yes, there. A human girl front and center, dark complexion, brown, curly hair, clocking her at about 15 or 16 years old, clutching a large cross to her chest, silver, possibly iron, chanting the same prayers as the other humans. The other humans are still crying, yes. However, this human girl... I paused. This human girl has not broken eye contact with the beast. I said into the recorder. Interesting. Very interesting. It seems that the hogmoth is having a reaction to the prayers. Or to her. I recorded. She's one to keep an eye on. We'll circle back later. Observation recorded and the phenomena cataloged. It was time to clean up this mess and call in the cousins. I pulled out the suitcase, Blue 82, and tuned it to the frequencies to match the human's heartbeats. After a messy case almost 1,991 years ago involving the Romans and a large cult following, basically, a small group of renegade humans had made exposure of the Lilith demon that we were on the cusp of almost almost subduing which resulted in wide-scale exposure. The crown had then tasked us with creating a weapon that could target only certain individuals, resulting in immediate results with only minimal damage. Thus, the Blue 82 was born. Set it to certain frequencies such as location, heartbeat, or crowd number, heck, even a mugshot, and the resulting blast would only affect them. In this case, after putting in the correct calculations, I set it off to make short work of these human meat suits, but not before letting that particular human girl go. I'm not a fan of humans, in fact, I find them vile and impulsive and downright fleshy, but I do admire the ones that show the tenacity to survive. And then, I called in my cousins. They came riding in on their literal white horses and made short work of the demon itself sent back to the dimension in which it came from. All that was left for me was the case paperwork, which I finished back in my Brooklyn loft with hot cocoa and my heated blanket. All in all, a pretty cool day. My job involves the tracking and classification of the five major types of a demon. Hargmond, the largest of the five, is strong, beastly, angry, and nearly impossible to put down. Its earthly body looks not unlike a large, bloated lizard, usually dark green, black, or dark blue or black. The hogmoth has ten massive hooked claws on each of its four legs. The hooked claws are tipped with the deadliest poison on earth, which has the ability to paralyze in seconds. Once its victim is completely paralyzed, the hogmoth will drag its helpless victim back into whatever cave or abandoned mine that serves as its lair. Unless it's been encouraged into a killing frenzy in which it'll just tear the town apart. The Hargmont has a large, blood-red fan that folds over his eyeless face. It is usually folded over unless the Hargmont is displaying aggressive behavior, in which it will undulate like a flower in the wind. Lilith, one of the smallest of the five, this one is particularly tricky as it has the ability to change shape. One of its preferred forms is the human female. The form is usually small, unassuming, but with a hypnotic spell that easily draws in droves of humans. There, it will nearly always use the ability to incite mass riots, purges, and other nefarious deeds. Lilith have been spotted at major points in the human's history. Jesus' crucifixion, the Trojan War, the Salem witch trials, the stabbing of Caesar, World War II, and the list goes on. When not presenting in its preferred human form, the Lilith is a small, gelatinous, blob-like creature with two dark eyes and waving tentacles down the two sides of its form. Iron is fatal to the Lilith, and in fact, the increase in the widespread use of iron is partly the reason why humans will occasionally survive the Lilith and therefore has given rise to many of the myths and fairy tales of witches and fairies. Undaestus This monstrous demon dwells primarily in large bodies of water. Although it's been a hundred years or so, 
The last time an undastis was spotted was deep down in the Mariana Trench. In fact, the last time this monstrous, enormous lizard shark was spotted, it inspired stories and legends that eventually helped influence Godzilla. It highly resembles the modern shark, but bigger, scarier, with more rows of teeth and is far, far more intelligent. Because it only resurfaces every 100 to 200 years, not much is known about this particular demon, but fellow catalogers like myself think it emits a certain sound, almost like a whale's call. But instead of something soft, serene, this particular sound will cause humans to throw themselves overboard or take the entire ship with them. It doesn't even eat humans. It eats plankton. We suspect it just enjoys the kill. Montyrum. This demon is found primarily in mountainous terrain. Appalachian, Rocky, and the Sierra Nevada. These demons are unusually unique as they don't seem to enjoy the thrill of the hunt for humans. They instead focus their diet on local fauna, wild goats, deer, etc. The grizzly bear especially is one of their favorite snacks. Over the years, we've become pretty lenient with these demons, and it's only when they accidentally cross paths with a human backpacker is when they're put back on the radar. The Monterum are typically between 15 feet tall and close to 700 pounds, with either pure white or dark black fur, and standing on two legs. The occasional human sighting and those that managed to get away have fueled the Yeti and Bigfoot legend. Does the Bigfoot exist? If it did, the Monterum probably ate it. Increasingly throughout the past few years, the Monterum have started coming down from their mountain layers and snatching people at the edge of cities. Is it the climate affecting the migration patterns of their usual diet of wild goats? Is it the wildfires? We're still not sure. Just over the last five years, we've recorded several instances of this happening in Denver, Colorado. As of last week, the Crown has moved this to our priority case. But I yes, I've saved you the best for last. We call it the Umbra, or the Dark. Even now, 500 years later, I still find myself terrified of this one. I've only encountered it one time and I still can't remember much from that day. In fact, there's not even much to learn about this demon from the books. Fellow catalogers recall encounters with this entity, and the following PTSD proves to be too much with high counts of memory loss, mental hospitalization, and even worse. Here's what I know. 1. It takes the form of a tall, dark, faceless man. 2. It likes to hide in dark spaces, such as in closets or under beds. And three, if it catches you, it likes to make a bargain. Give me something you love and I'll let you live. My colleague survived an encounter with an Umbra. It was the same day that I had encountered it. We had been battling a Hargmoth in an abandoned mall in southern Kentucky. It was big, ugly, and resisted all efforts to subdue it and sent it back to its home dimension. We called in reinforcements, more cousins, and had retreated to the loading dock to wait while the Hargmoth tore up an old navy in eclairs. This is where it gets fuzzy for me. I remember rushing in and scrambling to barricade the gate behind us. The Hargmoth had been following us, so we took extra care to chain the two parts of the gate together. A small gap was left because in our haste, we couldn't get the chain tight enough around the broken lock. I can still remember how cold the metal felt under my fingers. Odd, considering it was the height of summer in southern Kentucky. There are three things that happened next. One, we heard rustling behind us. I could feel my co-worker turn to look. Two, I felt him suddenly freeze. Now listen, this man doesn't freeze. A hardened vet and a beast of a man. He had been in the game for longer than I had been alive. And that's saying something, considering that I'm north of almost 500 years old. But on that day, I felt him freeze like a mouse, trapped under a hawk's gaze. And three, like a child, 
I felt myself being picked up and shoved through the small gap that we left in the fence. The fence tore large gouges in my face, neck, and chest, but it was nothing in comparison to the agony I heard in my colleague's screams. And then I blacked out. I woke up a month later in the ICU unit in a rural Kentuckian hospital. I had no identification on me, and in the chaos that the hog moth left behind that day, there had been no one left to check on me. After I woke up, I tore out the central catheter and made my way home. I learned what had become of the fate of my colleague. He was gone, of course. He was a strong man and he wasn't willing to let someone he loved be taken by the Umbra. For as much as we still don't know about the Umbra, we do know what happens when one of us is taken. For the Umbra is unique, in that it's the only demon that will take you back to the dimension that it comes from, and nothing good happens there, especially to your flesh, your heart, and your soul. His daughter knows. Once a year on the anniversary of her father's death, the Umbra visits her and shows her exactly what has happened to her father. And on that day, the Umbra gives her a choice. You are something that he loves. Give me you and I'll let him live. So far, as far as I'm aware, she has said no. I'm not sure which one I'm more afraid of. The Umbra itself, or someone I thought I loved letting the Umbra take me. But that's enough monster stories for now. In the meantime, I've got loads of case files to finish, a full dishwasher needing emptying, and piles of laundry left over from my last excursion. My little two-bedroom, two-bathroom flat needs a sturdy cleaning, and my little black kitten named the Spooky needs a bath. He occasionally spits fire, so I'll see how all this goes. Man, you should have seen my buddies when I walked into work last week. It turns out the last phenomena and observation file, the one that I had posted previously, ended up making quite a few laps around to the water cooler, much to the dismay of my superiors. Normally case files like this are made public, as the sheer scale of the damage and loss of human life is not meant for public consumption, and could potentially open the crown up to damaging lawsuits. My superiors were mad enough to spit fire, literally. And then, the absolute cherry on top. The bit I wrote about letting the human girl go. Apparently that small, inconsequential detail got copy-pasted onto some orange-haired, Love Island wannabe a trolls gossip page and it went viral. Luckily at that point, the cousins had gotten wind of what was happening downstream and went full executioner style and censored my name from everything. Also, I didn't realize it was happening at the time, but apparently the troll had gone full survivor meet to Hunger Games and created a reality type TV show that attempted to find that human girl. That troll, along with the help of a few weasel-faced producers, rounded up terrified humans that fit the description, my description, and attempted to find the next Katniss Everdeen by testing their skills against the dreaded Hargmoth. Yeah, apparently they all died, including the producers, and they never did find the girl. Nah, anyways, Finn, Dingo, and Rodney, my friends and fellow hunters, got a huge kick out of it. We were at work when the news broke, and the group chat went crazy. My man, Dingo texted, your name is everywhere. Okay, it's not Dingo, I replied. You can see that I've been scrubbed. It doesn't matter, dude, Rodney exclaimed. You're famous. Guys, chill. I know I messed up. Ha. That was Finn. A man of few words, if it is. Live a little man. This is cool as heck. Dingo texted. The human's heck, of course, and not ours. Think of how many Dixies we'll get when we drop this on him. No thanks. I exited the chat after that bit. It was funny though. Out of all the reactions to my little, I didn't think in a million years anybody would see this but oops, and now it's gone viral mistake. The one that hit the hardest wasn't the one that I expected. Wallace Jones, feared a monster hunter, teddy bear hugger, man who taught me how to shoot my first gun. 
my godfather, her. The man who raised me after my parents had passed away. Also, fun fact, the brother of the current reigning prince of the crown. He called me last night, absolutely furious. I could practically see the smoke coming from my device as he obliterated me from halfway across the world. Hello, I... You wrote about us. I... And on the internet, Fremont. His voice was tinny as it erupted from my phone. I, I can explain. Explain? He sighed heavily. How? How can you explain this? What in Misha's name were you thinking? I... The crushing guilt finally caught up and trapped me in steely jaws as the event from the last week had washed over me. I guess I didn't think anyone would ever see it. Another long sigh. It sounded like he was going through a tunnel. Look, I... I hated disappointing him. I'd say anything, everything to move the crushing stone of guilt from my chest. Look, I know it's not a good reason, but that's what I was thinking. My cat Spooky was uh, twisting around my feet. I had literally just walked into my apartment and Wallace had called me before I had a chance to feed her. Another second spent waiting and she was going to light something on fire. Look. His tone suddenly shifted. I could feel the stone sink deeper into my chest. The crown called me. The stone turned to ice. Your brother, you mean? Don't. His words cut through me. Don't sass me, boy. You'll get more details tomorrow, but due to the events surrounding your little publicity stunt. Okay, no, it wasn't. Oh, sorry, the idiocy situation you, an idiot, put yourself in. Okay, point taken. The Crown has decided to keep a closer eye on you. You come in with me on a trip tomorrow. You'll get the details in the morning. My stomach plummeted and sank all the way to the ground. My throat closed up. I could barely squeak out a response to the booming voice on the other end. But I have yoga tomorrow, 9am, and uh, dinner reservations too. I sputtered. Who's up? Uh, who's gonna watch Spooky? Spooky me out at the mention of her name. She was sitting at my feet and looking up at me. Her yellow eyes glowed, and the tips of her ears were beginning to smoke. I could hear Wallace laughing at the other end of the line. You still got that thing as a pet. I'm surprised it hasn't eaten you yet. Spooky suspiciously said nothing in return. 400 hours, boy. I'm sending the jet to pick you up. Be on the roof of your building by then or I'm taking the collar off, Spooky. You know, all UFO sightings by humans... Hovering lights spotted above cities and possibly fast aircraft darting past a U.S. Air Force. Suspiciously shaped aircraft in the shape of triangles or cigar tubes. Yeah, that's actually us. To date, every sighting of a UFO by a human dating back all the way to 1639 has actually been a Crown aircraft. Does this mean that aliens don't exist? I haven't really thought about it, I guess. Those fleshy meatbags have such a fixation on that sort of thing. The sky god. The daddy god who lives in the mountain in the sky. Little green things flying down and sticking things up there. Anyways. Crown technology has always been very advanced. We had light bulbs when humans had fire. We had light speed rails when humans were first figuring out cars. And we've had flying technology since humans first started figuring out that seatbelts were a good idea and their newfangled driving death machine. That's how I was able to find myself hovering above Pijuratelagala, a mountainous region in Sri Lanka, about an hour after I was beamed up above my walk up in Brooklyn. I had barely had time to even enjoy my bagel. Strap in, Fremont, Wallace bellowed, his jacket and khaki pants flying everywhere as they were tugged manically by the wind. Time to jump. Okay, for the record, I think this is a very bad idea. Wallace was bent over laughing, his hands on his knees. Let's go, boy. I don't think you'll enjoy the fall otherwise. Okay, you know I'm bad at this. Why don't you just beam me? But before I could finish, 
Wallace had jumped out of the plane. I could see his little red parachute opening up miles below us. Beam me down, I sighed. It was quiet in the cabin, apart from the high-pitched whistling of the wind from outside the chute door. I looked longingly at the last bit of bagel for my breakfast. I was going to have to wait. I pulled my dreads back into a low pony and tightened the strap that held my glasses on my face. I thought I wasn't supposed to follow people if they jumped off a bridge. I grumbled to myself. But fine. I guess I'll jump. Fremont, now that wasn't so bad, was it? Wallace exclaimed. It took me a second to clear my head. When my eyes focused, I couldn't tell if he was upside down or if I was upside down. No, it was me. I was upside down. Uh, Wallace, uh, I'm currently in a tree. That you are. He pulled out his machete. Let me help you down. No, no, please stop. Just help me untangle and I can... Thwack, I thought. Oh, God. I hit the ground hard, twisting my shoulder. And the rest of my body followed. And I was twisted over myself, tumbling down a small embankment and into what was most definitely a snake-filled pond. We had crash-landed into the jungle at the foot of the mountainous base. It was one of the largest peaks in Sri Lanka. It was hot and sticky, and there were also bugs everywhere. I freaking hate bugs. According to Wikipedia, this mountain, it was the tallest mountain in Sri Lanka. It is situated northeast of the town of Nawara Aliyah, and is easily visible from most areas of the central province. Its summit is home to the Central Communications Array of the Government of Sri Lanka, and armed forces and serves as an important point in the country's radar system. Hey, thanks Wikipedia. It's also, as I learned, home to the base of the Communications Array of the Sri Lankan Government and Armed Forces, which, as I also learned, has been witnessing an unprecedented rise of unexplained animal attacks and disappearances. It was mainly still unreported on, but there was a growing cry of panic echoed in the major news outlets in Sri Lanka. Dina Mina was reporting on it, as was Lenka Deepa, even Ravaya. The notorious Celebrity Hungry tabloid was printing about the disappearances. We were here to figure out what was happening. Most of the attacks were clustered around the southernmost tip of the bays, which is where we were heading now. Coincidentally, that's also where the communications and the electricity base was. The armed forces were mainly sequestered in the northern and western parts of the square grid. Most of the disappearances were workers tending to the power grid. When something would go dark, they would send somebody out. Except now, no one was coming back. When I couldn't figure out on the plane ride over was, how were people disappearing? I mean, the base was literally armed to the teeth. After all, they had put this massive power and communications grid in a jungle filled with already terrifying creatures, thrown an occasional civil conflict or two, and they had figured out how to protect this thing. Tall, thick walls encircled the entire base. Barbed wire ran thickly across the walls. Plus, the workers were inside the grid when they had disappeared. What was getting them? Wallace, I whined. Wallace, are we almost there yet? We had been walking for what felt like hours. The terrain was steep, the jungle was thick, and I was wearing white suede tennis shoes. Hey Wallace, you could have given me a heads up that we were going to be hiking. Wallace swung the machete hard. Hiking is good, he grunted. Be stronger. But why couldn't we have jumped out of the plane a little bit closer to our destination? Would have alerted the humans. He grunted, pulling down a vine. Needed to be far out. A flock of birds flew up, scaring me. I missed my little Brooklyn flat. I miss Spooky. I missed. I slipped hard. My left leg slipped out from underneath me, pulling me down into something disgusting. Oh god, I yelled. Is this what I think it is? Oh god, it is. It's crap. Wallace, I held my hands up. They were covered in gooey, reddish-brown clumps that smelled like weak old roadkill on an Arizona highway. 
Wallace, help me out here. I saw him wheel around. Boy, if you don't get your... He stopped. I saw all the color drain from his face. His dark skin went to ashy. What? I whimpered softly. My throat clenched. What is it? Get up. What? I said get up. Wallace grabbed my arm hard and pulled me from it. I tried not to wince as my white tennis shoes made a soft shlunking as I was pulled upright. Wallace, what the heck's going on? I know what that is. He was wheeling around his machete out. My blood ran cold and the jungle seemed to drop by 10 degrees. The flock of birds that I heard calling earlier had gone quiet. We were underneath the thick canopy that moments ago had been filled with buzzing, flicking flies, cicadas, crawling worms, and more. Now it felt like we were standing in a cemetery. Suddenly, I realized what I was looking at too. It was the base. With the adrenaline pumping through me, my mind cleared and I suddenly realized just how close we were to the site of the disappearances. It's just crap. And whose crap is that? While well, I pondered that for a second. Well, it isn't mine. He looked back at me. The look in his eyes scared me silent. Monterom. I felt like the breath was knocked out of me. Here? Here, take this. He pulled a gun from his backpack and threw it to me. We need to move quickly. Wait. I almost dropped it. You brought a gun? I thought we were just doing recon. We're running to the base. We'll be safer inside those walls. With how scared I was and with how much adrenaline I had pumping through me, I had almost forgot about how much demon poop was drying on my skin. Almost. Safer, wait. But people were disappearing on the inside. If a monterum catches us out here, we'll be torn apart. We're running in three. One. Wait, huh? Two. Wallace, I. Three. Wallace took off running. For being almost 900 years old, that man is fast. I took off after him. No more using the machete. We ran full tilt into the thick foliage of the jungle. Branches hit us across the face. Thorns dug deep gouges into our arms and legs. Uprooted tree roots threatened to trip us. We didn't fall once with the sheer panic that was keeping us going. We were so close, almost there. I could see the walls looming ahead of us. I was bleeding profusely from the thick scratch across my chest. The white wife beater was soaked with my blood. I didn't want to think about all the infectious diseases that were most certainly inside it. My ankle twisted hard as we pushed through a particularly thick ring of trees and I almost tripped over another road. But as I pushed through, my hand suddenly felt... nothing. I fell to my knees. No more trees and no more roots, or any thick branches hitting me. I looked around and it looked like a clearing. Specifically, a clearing underneath the base's walls. I felt a surge of hope. We made it. Fremont! Wallace came rushing over. I found a door, it's heavy and steel, but I think I can pick it. I put the kit in your backpack if you could just... He paused and his hand on my shoulder and then he went still. With a sinking feeling, I realized that the birds had gone silent too. What? I started to whisper. His hand tightened on my throat. It was silent in the clearing, apart from some faint rustling to my left. Fighting the urge to vomit, I turned to look. It was the most monstrous thing that I had ever seen. A towering, massive creature. 15, maybe 18 feet tall. But the smell was what hit you first. Bloody and ripe. Like an open wound, packed full of flies and maggots. Left out in the hot sun to fester and blister. It was walking on all fours, its hands dragging like an ape's. It was searching for us. Its shaggy head swaying back and forth as its black beady eyes tried to see in the dark. It was probably close to 1,000 pounds. It had the chest of a bulldog and the arms and head of an overgrown ape. It had thick white fur. It was densely matted and stained dark brown around the mouth, its chest and its hands. 
It had opposable thumbs too, which I noticed as it easily ripped a 20 foot eucalyptus tree and tossed it aside. The crash shook the forest. Dang, I kind of wish I had my tape recorder right now. In a blinding shock, I realized something. Everything that I had read about the Amaterum had always mentioned that this demon type was more tolerated than others. That these demons were allowed to live more or less freely in the forest and the mountains. So long as they continued their steady diet of goats, pigs, and other wildlife and livestock. Or maybe I realized it was because no one wanted to follow them into the mountains to kill them. I started hyperventilating as it sniffed the air and crawled closer. Being in the field is the one thing, but I'm an observer most of the time. I'm in a nearby coffee shop, typing up notes while my cousins, the lean, mean, and let's face it, insane fighting machines that took care of the demons. For Amisha's sake, I do the paperwork. I was going to die. It's blind, Wallace whispered. What? Look at its eyes, it's been blinded. I forced myself to focus. And that's when I noticed it. A horrific, a thick band of scar tissue ran diagonal across its face. Starting from the right temple, it dug a deep hole that cut directly through its right eye, its nose and below its left eye, and through its left ear too. The scar tissue was bubbly and a deep, dark red. The hide of the Mataram is famously thick. It would take something strong to break through the skin like that. Misha above, what, what did that? My guess is another Monterum, a bigger one. I nearly passed out. A bigger one. There's a door, Wallace whispered. His voice was almost completely silent. A steel door to your left. I looked and I could see it. So far away, I squeaked. That's our only shot. I felt my mouth go dry. It was at least 50 feet away and locked, I'm sure. Wallace, I'm, I'm not going to make it. His grip tightened on my shoulder. Yes, you can. Uh, I can, I'm not as fast as you. It felt like he could tear my shoulder right off. Fremont, if you don't run, I won't run. I looked up at him through tear-filled eyes, and I could see that he was crying too. After all we've been through, I'm not leaving here without you, boy. I'm three, I whispered. Three. Slowly but surely, like the incoming tide, feeling began to seep back into my hands and feet. My right hand twitched. I flexed it. It didn't feel weak anymore. One, I whispered. Two, I prepared myself to run. The Monterum was literally a foot and a half away from us, its horrifically ravaged face sniffing the air. Three. Suddenly, in a blur of noise, teeth and claws, a second Monterum ripped Wallace away from me. Run, Fremont! Wallace was in the Monterum's jaw, struggling to hold up the ten-inch teeth from puncturing him. The demon's tongue, rubbery and vile, was hooked around him, trying to pull him downward into its throat. I could see Wallace trying to go for his sword. I was strapped to his waist, uselessly caught underneath his flailing body. Run for the door, Fremont. Get out of here. I can't leave you. The gun. Wallace is gone. A Smith & Wesson M&P Shield M2, but modified with a little crown technology. Able to take down packs of Hargmonts. Outfitted with a magical lethal and endless clip. I scrambled for it. My back to the wall, my fingers tracing the metal body trying to find the safety. The monster roared again. Crap. The first, Amatra on the blind one, finally caught wind of where I was. It was charging straight towards me, the demon going into attack mode. Its engorged body was standing in an upright position, running on two legs as its claws retracted outwards. It was drooling long, thick ropes of drool clung to its body, slicking down its blood-stained fur. The safety, I flicked it. Boom. It caught its shoulder. It flinched, but it didn't slow down. Boom, bam. Nothing. It hit the ground for a second, but shook it off easily. I swear that I just saw it laugh at me. The Monterum are notoriously extremely difficult to take down. Books upon books have been written about their fierceness, their animal-like ability to take pain and keep fighting. 
Legends have been inscribed in history about entire mountain ranges being decimated when two male Matram get caught in a heat-soaked battle over a female. If this overgrown, two-stuffed build bear thinks it's taking me down, it's got another thing coming. It screeched again. Wallace had pulled free of his demon's mouth. He had one hand deep in that thing's eye and was using its eye socket to pull himself free. It was screeching a horrible noise that caused a terrible ringing sensation in my ears. Fremont, duck. I ducked. Another screech. Wallace had thrown a sword. It flew over me and stabbed my mantrum directly in the air. Noise it made and knocked me to my knees. Wallace gave a hard yank. The sword, which was attached to Wallace's belt with a retractable leash, started to drag the mantrum to him. Fremont the gun, shoot it again. Boom, nothing. Another boom, nothing. It struggled like a fish on a hook. Thrashing about, its violence was absolutely breathtaking. Blood pouring from its ear, the blind Monterum was going berserk. Its claws were fully extended and annihilating everything in its path. The other Monterum was caught in the middle of that. Wallace was standing on the second Monterum's shoulder, dragging the other one to it. Its claws caught the face of the second Monterum tearing it open. In pain, the second demon reached up, grabbed Wallace and threw him off. Wallace flew 20 yards, tumbling over himself before hitting the wall hard. Wallace! He wasn't moving. My heart leapt to my throat. Something had cracked when he hit the wall. No, 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 no! Wallace! With a sickening, squishing sound, the blind Monterum pulled the sword from its ear. A gush of red spouted after it. It shook its head, red flying everywhere before tossing the sword towards the lifeless body of Wallace. Come on, Wallace, get up! I screamed. I turned to see both Matram beginning to stand up. The violence that Wallace had inflicted on both was absolutely devastating. They were in terrible shape. Blood was smeared everywhere. It was still gushing from the blind one's ear, and it was dripping from the broken eye socket on the other. Its eye was hanging out, dangling about like a minnow caught in a bobber. Crap, I said again quieter this time. I checked the gun. Boom, I caught the big one on the shoulder. The blind one ducked behind and started to go around. It jumped and started to crawl vertically along the wall. Ah, so that's how the disappearances were happening from the inside. Boom, clink. I missed. Instead of the demon, the bullet caught the steel window near the top. Wallace, wake up. More shots. Both Monterum were advancing. I was backed up against the wall. The concrete wall dug into my back. The steel rivulets digging painfully into me. I had knocked the blind Monterum off the wall, but not before it had caught me with a chunk of concrete that it had ripped off the side. The concrete chunk had torn open my left shoulder and I was bleeding profusely. I could feel the strength draining from me as every second passed by. I needed a plan and fast. I looked around, the jungle was to my left, and darkness had fallen and by this point, the jungle's shadows had deepened and by human standards, it looked absolutely impenetrable. But my kind, well, we work best in the dark. I had an opening. If I could lead them into the jungle, I would have a better chance of losing them in the darkness. Then I could circle back to where Wallace still lay lifeless. I would grab him and hopefully find that distress button that he should have on him. What if he wasn't? Stop, I shook my head. I couldn't think about that right now. I started backing up towards the jungle. The blind one wouldn't be able to follow and the second Matram would probably stay behind to finish the weakened one off. They were notoriously not pack creatures. They preferred to roam independently or sometimes with a mate. It was astonishing that there were two males I assumed in the same area right now, let alone working together to take us down. I snorted. Just our luck. Hey, idiots. Both looked at me or well tried to. Yeah, that's right. Follow me, you freaking sewer rats. I kept backing up. They both fell on four legs and started to crawl after me. It was working. Follow me. Come get me. We were inches away from the forest and I was prepared to bolt knowing that they would chase after me. The blood loss was bad and I could feel myself losing strength, but I gritted my teeth and prepared to run. 
I steadied myself and counted to three. One. Two. I suddenly thought of Spooky. If this doesn't work, somebody better feed her. I muttered to myself. Three. Multiple crashes. Move. Suddenly, a small black figure came blazing out of the forest. I was knocked down, my butt hitting the ground hard as I struggled to avoid flying debris. My head was spinning, and I shook it several times trying to clear it. My vision was still a little blurry from how hard that I was hit, but my eyes focused in time to see the large, vicious Montrum locked in combat with this figure. What are you doing? I yelled. I was struggling to keep my eyes open. Wallace, where was Wallace? I needed to get to Wallace. The figure was dressed entirely in black, and they had on a large, long black overcoat, which whirled behind them as they fought to keep the Montrum off me. Two long black swords at the rough sparks with every hit against the Montrum's thick skin. What are you doing? Stay down, they yelled at me. The person was struggling. They were taking hit after hit. Wallace and I had barely been able to handle both and this person was trying to take both down now. Suddenly, the person was thrown at 30 feet in the air and fell hard against the trees. And suddenly, it was very, very quiet in the clearing. I gulped. Now, it was just me and two very upset Montrum. Laughing. The Montrum were laughing at me. Die. It raised its hand, all ten claws extended, and I closed my eyes. In the dark from behind my closed eyes, suddenly everything was filled with a painful, bright red light. It was a searing pain. My eyes felt like they had been burned, like somebody had turned the sun on high and I was caught looking at it. I struggled to open them. Get down! The person, a woman, ripped off the big black hood she had over her face. In between her eyes sat a large, bright red crystal. It was embedded into her brown skin and it was smoking. Stay down, she screamed, and she shot an enormous electric red beam of light from the center of her forehead. It sliced through the Montrum. She cut an enormous gash through the center of the demon's face and they turned to run. Like enormous, overgrown, insanely vicious puppies. They tucked their tails between their legs and they ran. I couldn't handle this. From the blood loss to the fight to the enormous bolt of energy that was shot from her face, I could feel myself starting to shut down. I heard her run over. Through my narrowing vision, I saw her bend down. My name's Aja, she said, before everything went black. Seems like I got here just in time.